Well, good morning, folks, and welcome to Clinton United Church. I'm Reverend Kathy Larmond, and I'm the minister here. A few announcements before we get started. Uh, we do have a virtual fellowship time on Sunday mornings between 10.30 and noon. Anyone is welcome to drop in. It's on, um, on Zoom. Uh, if you don't have the link and you would like it, then please contact me, and I'd be glad to send it to you. We are still having our Thursday evening sing songs virtually. We're on YouTube. A new one goes up every Thursday, at least until the end of June. And you can always go back and sing some of your favorites on our previous weeks. So sing at home loud and proud without your masks. A few meetings coming up. Uh, June the 1st, Tuesday, is an outreach meeting. And on June the 2nd is worship and music. Contact your chair if you're not sure how that is happening. They'll either be by YouTube or by teleconference. Sorry, by Zoom or by teleconference. Our church directories, our pictorial directories are here. Yay! Uh, please pick them up from the office if you are supposed to have one. We will also be giving them out. Uh, well, I guess by the time you see this, we will have been giving them out yesterday on Saturday morning. So if you haven't picked yours up, if you had your picture taken or submitted a picture, then you, there's one waiting for you. We have begun our brick repointing project. Uh, the people will be coming to start the work this coming week and we have begun the inside work that was needed. So just letting you know that yes, we have begun the project that we told you about in the board's last letter. And uh, if you wish to make a donation towards the project, then please contact the office and we'd be glad to tell you how to go about doing that. We have done, done our stuff the truck. By the time you get this, we will have done it yesterday. As far as I'm concerned, we're doing it tomorrow. <laughs> so thank you everybody who has and will be donating to that. And I have no idea how it turned out because it hasn't happened yet for me. But thank you so much for everybody who helped to organize it and who took part. I'm sure that we got a wonderful response. Clinton is a very, very uh, giving and supportive town. Were there any other announcements? Anybody knows about? No? Nope. In that case, I'd like to tell you something from the Mission and Service Fund of the United Church of Canada. That is our outreach mission for the entire church, and uh, it's possible to make a donation to that in your offering envelope on any given Sunday. So just wanted to, to let you know a little bit about this project here. This is called Where Food and Community Grow. Over the last year, the need for food has skyrocketed. Since the pandemic began, Fred Victor, a charity based in Toronto, Ontario, has served over 180,000 free and low-cost meals to people in need, a 40% increase over the previous years. Growing food security issues are just one of the reasons why Fred Victor's community gardens are so necessary right now. In addition to providing vital food services, shelter, counseling, and job training to support people living in poverty and experiencing homelessness, Fred Victor runs over 240 gardens where local community members garden together. It's an activity they can still enjoy amid lockdown restrictions. The pandemic has pushed more people into poverty. More people are experiencing food insecurity and hunger. That is why we see these gardens as more than just plots of land with plants growing in them. For every harvest that makes its way onto plates and into bellies, and for every resident who feels empowered by their surroundings, these gardens represent our vision for healthy and thriving communities, says Fred Hambly, Fred Victor's CEO. Today, over 200 families, many of whom live in poverty, grow their own nutritious food through these gardens. But the food itself isn't the only benefit of the gardening program. At Fred Victor, gardening isn't just about growing food, it's about growing community too. What we grow reflects our community's vibrant cultural diversity. In our gardens, kiwi and amaranth grow alongside strawberries, carrots, and garlic, which grow alongside indigenous healing and ceremonial plants such as tobacco and sage, says Mark Woodruff, Fred Fred Victor's Senior Manager, Community Food Center. Gardening and nutritional education, healthy food choices, and strong relationships are cornerstones of the gardening initiative. 
and there are plans to expand. We're looking to expand the program over the next year, turning plots at one of our locations into a micro farm that will supply fresh ingredients to the meals served out of our community hub, Woodruff explains. Your gifts through mission and service not only help feed families, but also support building healthy communities through organizations like Fred Victor. Thank you for helping your neighbors across our country flourish. So that was something that was just put up on the 25th of May. So that is very, very um, recent. So that is one of the ways that your mission and service fund dollars go to help people right here in Canada. Lord, we give you thanks for light, the light of your Son, Jesus Christ, coming into our lives. Enlighten and illumine us that we may worship you this day in spirit and in truth. Amen. Our first hymn on this Trinity Sunday is Holy, Holy, Holy. From the book of Isaiah, chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the master sitting on a throne, high exalted, and the train of his robes filled the temple. Angel seraphs hovered above him, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two their feet, and with two they flew. And they called back and forth one to the other. Holy, holy, holy is the God of the angel armies. His bright glory fills the whole earth. The foundations trembled at the sound of the angel voices. 
and the whole house filled with smoke. I said, doom, it's doomsday, I'm as good as dead. Every word I've ever spoken is tainted, blasphemous even. And the people I, with, I live with, they talk the same way, using words that corrupt and desecrate. And here I've looked God in the face, the king, the God of the angel armies. Then one of the angel seraphs flew to me. He held a live coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. He touched my mouth with the coal and said, Look, this coal has touched your lips, gone your guilt, your sins wiped out. And then I heard the voice of the master. Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I spoke up. I'll go. Send me. We're now on Psalm 29. <clears throat> Ascribe to God, you powers of the heaven, ascribe to God all glory and strength. Ascribe due honor to God's holy name and worship in the beauty of holiness. God's voice is over the waters, God's glory thundering across the great waters. God's, God's voice, voice is power, God's voice is full of majesty. God's voice shatters the cedars, splinters the cedars of Lebanon. God's, God's voice makes Lebanon skip like a calf, Mount Hermon stampede like a wild young bull. God's voice forks into tongues of fire, God's voice shakes the wilderness, sets trembling the wilderness of Kadesh. God's voice causes the oaks to whirl, stripping the forest bare, and in the temple all cry, Glory! God sits enthroned above the waters. God is enthroned and sovereign forever. You give strength to your people, O God. Now give to your people the blessing of peace. Glory, glory, glory to our Lord. Reading from Romans chapter 8, starting at verse uh, 15. This resurrection life you've received from God is not a timid, grave-tending life. It's adventurously expectant, greeting God with a childlike, what's next, Papa? God's spirit touches our spirits and confirms who we really are. We know who he is, and we know who we are, father and children. And we know we are going to get what's coming to us, an unbelievable inheritance. We go through exactly what Christ goes through. If we go through the hard times with him, then we're certainly going to go through the good times with him. And reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 3. Now there was a man of the Pharisee sect, Nicodemus, a prominent leader among the Jews. Late one night he visited Jesus and said, Rabbi, we all know you're a teacher, straight from God. No one could do all the God-pointing, God-revealing acts you do if God weren't in on it. And Jesus said, you're absolutely right. Take it from me. Unless a person is born from above, it's not possible to see what I'm pointing to, to God's kingdom. How can anyone, said Nicodemus, be born who has already been born and grown up? You can't re-enter your mother's womb and be born again. What are you saying with this born from above talk? Jesus said, you're not listening. Let me say it again. Unless a person submits to this original creation, the wind hovering over the water creation, the invisible moving the visible, a baptism into a new life, it's not possible to enter God's kingdom. 
When you look at a baby, it's just that, a body you can look at and touch. But the person who takes shape within is formed by something you can't see and touch, the spirit, and becomes a living spirit. So don't be so surprised when I tell you that you have to be born from above, out of this world, so to speak. You know well enough how the wind blows this way and that. You hear it rustling through the trees, but you have no idea where it comes from or where it's headed next. That's the way it is with everyone born from above, by the wind of God, the spirit of God. Nicodemus asked, what do you mean by this? Like, how does this happen? And Jesus said, you're a respected teacher of Israel and you don't know these basics? Listen carefully. I'm speaking sober truth to you. I speak only of what I know by experience. I give witness only to what I've seen with my own eyes. There's nothing secondhand here, no hearsay. Yet, instead of facing the evidence and accepting it, you procrastinate with questions. If I tell you things that are as plain as the hand before your face and you don't believe me, what use is there in telling you of things you can't see, the things of God? No one has ever gone up into the presence of God except the one who came down from that presence, the Son of Man. In the same way that Moses lifted the serpent in the desert so people could have something to see and then believe, it is necessary for the Son of Man to be lifted up, and everyone who looks up to him, trusting and expectant, will gain a real life, eternal life. This is how much God loved the world. He gave his Son, his one and only Son. And this is why, so that no one need be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God didn't go to all the trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. He came to help, to put the world right again. Anyone who trusts in him is acquitted. Anyone who refuses to trust in him has long since been under the death sentence without knowing it. And why? Because of that person's failure to believe in the one-of-a-kind Son of God when introduced to him. May God bless these readings to our hearing and to his name be all the praise and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We're going to sing Praise Our Maker. to my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts and minds be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, this Sunday is Trinity Sunday. I like to look at it this way. After this time, this Sunday, we get into what's called ordinary time or creation time. And that's when we talk about all the mighty things that God has done. Now, we talk about Jesus, too, but we get all of the mighty stuff that God has done. 
Then come about Advent, we start talking about Jesus, and we talk about Jesus for, for Advent and Christmas, and then we talk about him in the season after Epiphany, because that's all the stuff, the, the building up of, of, of Jesus and his followers. And then we get to Easter, and we talk about Jesus some more, and then we get through all of Easter for 50 days, and then we get one day to talk about the Spirit. So God gets months, Jesus gets months, and Spirit gets one. Then the next Sunday, we get to talk about how the three of them work together. And that's where we are now. We're on Trinity Sunday. So that's kind of the, the, the not thing that's up there. And the idea is it's almost like uh, St. Patrick's shamrock, trying to show you how the, the, all the parts end up working together. We have God in the middle. We have Father. We have Son. We have Holy Spirit, and, or Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer, however the words you want to use to describe them. And that's trying to figure out how it is that we get a God that is somehow three and at the same time just one. So one of the, th the things that I kind of like to look at, somebody said to make it an egg, and I, I, I don't want to do an egg. So we're doing an apple, and that's the idea that God is the outside, the skin that goes around and holds everything together, the creator that protects everything that's inside. And then you've got Jesus, the word made flesh. Well, that would be the flesh of the apple. And then you've got the seeds, and the seeds are... are what moves us on from there that they could create the new apple trees and, and the potential. So it's just, if, it's, if we took away the skin, it wouldn't be an apple. If we took away the seeds, it wouldn't be an apple. If we took away the flesh, well, it really wouldn't be an apple then because that's what we eat. Now we won't get into the communion aspects of that. Okay, I don't think it's gonna catch on to have Jesus as, to have apples for communion. So we'll let you know. Okay, nope. But, they each together all come together to form an apple. One cannot be there without the others. So that, that's a way of explaining it perhaps a bit more to children. Um, I think it's every time we try and say that God is like a shamrock, God is like an egg, God is like an apple, God is like water. You have ice, you have water, you have steam, and yet they are all, all water, but yeah, they're very, very different. We always keep putting that word like in there because any analogy, when you push it a little bit too far, falls apart. So we try to understand Trinity. We try and understand how God can be God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Um, but it's not easy. But we try. Because we know that God is one. But we also know that when we experience God, we often experience uh, our relationship with Jesus, for example, as being a little different from our relationship with God and with spirit. It's just, it's a feeling more so than anything else, but we also are very aware that God is in fact one. So th this one kind of puts it out rather well. We've got God, the, the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not the Father, but somehow they all together are God. Another visual, another way of trying to figure out how we think about Trinity. Uh, probably the best way is to say it's a mystery and um, yeah, kind of go from there. We're not ever going to completely understand it. This is from, um, it's from the shack, and I think it's page 109, 108 in my copy. And interesting, the, sh the shack has a different way of looking at it, and I kind of like it. If I were simply one God and only one person, then you would find yourself in this creation without something wonderful, without something essential even, love and relationship. All love and relationship is possible for you only because it already exists within me, within God myself. This is obviously the Papa, the, the God figure who is saying this. The idea being that because um, the Trinity is a relationship of, of three, three beings that are still one, that's how we have love and that's how God can love, learn to love us because there is a relationship there that is happening between the different parts, the Trinity and then with us. So God, God is love and God loves us as well. So one of the things, uh, the reason why they have that first reading there is because it is a wonderful vision from Isaiah of what does God look like. God sitting on his throne with his train of his robe filling the temple and angels and seraphim and stuff all floating around and, and, and a wonderful smoky loud fire and brimstone type of vision. He needs a coal from, from the altar 
to, to cleanse his tongue so that he can say, here I am, send me. This is the call of Isaiah, the vision that he has. But this is also a lot of the times how we kind of view God. God is the guy that's sitting in the temple on the throne, usually white hair, beard. There we go. That is, that is God up there, kind of a cosmic Santa, keeping lists. Have we been bad or have we been good? What's going to happen next? The judge on the throne. And that is, is one vision that we have of God. We also speak of God as creator and the idea of God being there from the very beginning. That is the first person of the Trinity, the creator. Yet, and of course, out of that comes the call of Isaiah, here I am, send me. But what's interesting to me for the readings, for the, for the other reading for this Sunday, the one from John, is that essentially we have the second person of the Trinity trying to explain to us the third person of the Trinity. So we have Nicodemus who has come by night because he's kind of scared of all the Jewish leadership. And he's come to talk to Jesus. And Jesus is talking to him about being born again, being born from above, and talking about spirit. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So Jesus, whom we always know is extremely important to God. A lot of us, that's our vision of God is Jesus. When we try and think about God, our brain kind of goes sideways because we can't get our minds around something so big and so vast and so wonderful. And yet we can relate to Jesus, to a human who was living on earth and who got tired and hungry and scared and mad and all the things that we do. Jesus did those things too. So in a lot of ways, we relate best to the second person of Trinity, which is probably exactly why he came. Because he wanted, God wanted us to be able to know that we, that he understands, that God understands us and living the way that we do. And that God cares enough to go through all this trouble to make himself human. And I'm using the word him, but, but you know God isn't male or female, but we don't have a pronoun for God that works. That God came and became a human being, an incredibly humbling process. And once he was human, he stayed human. Jesus was human, became human all the way through. But this is Jesus saying, it's not just about understanding me. It's not just about the example that I set for you and the way that I show you how to live a good life the way that God wants us to, but spirit. Spirit is absolutely important. As I said, in our church here, spirit gets a really short shrift. It only actually gets one Sunday. But here's Jesus saying, no, spirit is absolutely huge here. You have to be born of water and spirit or you cannot enter the kingdom of God. You need to have spirit be a part of your spirit, a part of who you are. But spirit is not tame. None of God is tame. The spirit, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, you can't tell where it's come from, where it's going, and that spirit moves the people of God. That spirit makes us do things that sometimes we're not too sure about. It causes us to take chances that maybe we might not because God wants us to. Because God says, this is the way I want you to go. I'm going to, I'm going to push your boat that way whether you really want to or not. Spirit is lively and is alive. Spirit speaks to us and changes us from the inside out. But this is also the reading that gives us this incredibly well-known phrase, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him we might be saved. So God is hugely important. God creates everything. God, the creator, is the basis of everything that we have. 
And spirit, we've got to have God's spirit. We've got to have that movement into the future. We've got to have that means of God to tell us where God wants us to go next. It's not just about what God did back there, but what God calls us to do into the future. But in the middle of all that, we've got Jesus. We've got God's son that by belief in God, in Jesus, we are saved. All three parts, incredibly important, all three parts woven together, working together to save us. I know we're not just not that important, but to God apparently, yes we are, that God will go to all this trouble to create the world for us to stand on, God's son to come, and God's spirit to change us and to make us into something new. For those who are led by the spirit of God are the children of God. Now how often do we look that happy about it, that excited, that energetic, and yet that's what the spirit is calling us to be. That is what God's spirit is making us into. We are to be called the children of God. For you have not received a spirit of bondage to fear, but the spirit of adoption, so that we cry, Daddy, Abba, Father. That is the relationship that God's looking for, that relationship of exuberance, of joy, of excitement, and of love, that we love God because God has reached out to us and said we can call God Daddy that intimate, familiar relationship. For the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. That's what spirit does. It connects us with Jesus, it connects us with God, and it connects us with each other. For God is love, and those who love are the children of God. That's how we're called upon to live, to be the children of God. Thanks be to God. Everything that we have, every gift that we've been given, comes to us as a gift from God. We are called upon to give back, to give back to God and to God's people, God's children. Let us now take a few moments to remember our gifts and how we share them while we listen to Louise share hers.
we thank you for the many gifts that you have given to us. You give us these gifts for the upbuilding of your people and of your church. Grant that the gifts that we give back to you this day, along with ourselves, grant that they may be used to further your kingdom here in this place and around the world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And we're going to sing God Whose Almighty Word. one, we don't actually understand Trinity. We'd like to, but it's a mystery. Somehow you are one God, holy, indivisible, and yet we experience you as the creator, as Jesus, as spirit. We say, oh, it's like being a daughter, a grandma, and a mom, a wife, an aunt. But somehow it's both more and less than that. Your differences are more profound, and yet your unity is also more profound. No, we don't understand, but we rejoice. We rejoice in the one who created everything that is, the one who is totally powerful and yet gentle, the one who's willing to do anything, be anything needed to bring us home again. the one who was willing to become the word made flesh to dwell among us, the one who was willing to become a baby, a helpless little baby, willing to go through an entire life and even death to show us what we could be, to prove to us the love that God has 
for each one of us. The one who is the spirit wild and free, moving on the face of the waters at creation, coming down as a dove on Jesus, and entering into each and every one of our hearts. The spirit that moves us and changes us and remakes us into who you need us to be, who we need to be. The one who lives in our hearts and whispers in our souls and brings us your peace. We give thanks, Holy One. And yet you must weep. You must weep for the world that we have, that we can't seem to change. For the things that we have done, us and the ones who came here before us. Lord, we heard this morning, Friday, of the graves at the Kamloops Residential School. 215 children, the youngest was about three. We did what we thought was right, and it turned out so wrong. And I gather we then hid the results of that. But everything comes to light. You know what happened. You know both the good and the very bad that came from those residential schools. You must have wept. for all the people in India and Africa, for all the people in Manitoba who are so sick right now. As we go through wave after wave of this pandemic, Lord, we'd really, really like to make this one the last one. We hope so. We pray so. We pray for those who don't have the medical capabilities that we have here in Canada that's helped to keep our death toll, hard though it is for those who have died and their, for their families, it is so much lower than it is elsewhere where the medical system has collapsed. Lord, we pray for them. We pray for the people who are helping the people who are doctors and nurses and the people working in the hospitals, all the ones who are trying to keep people alive right now. We pray for the people who are doing all the vaccinating day after day after day, another arm, another one, another one, another one, as they pr try to vaccinate millions in a race against time before we end up with another variant that it won't touch. Lord, we pray for them. We pray for them and for their peace. Lord, be with us. As we try and figure out how we can help make a difference. How what we do or don't do can help to try and get this under some control. How what we do and don't do can help to feed those that are hungry and help those who have lost their jobs all the things that have been a side effect of this pandemic as we try and figure out how to get back to a new normal, whatever that is, and how to take with us out of this the things that we need to change, the way we need to treat people differently, the way we need to support people when they get sick differently. Be with us, Lord. Help us to listen to your spirit whispering in our souls, to our hearts that ache for others. 
and to you in your voice. Whom shall I send? Lord, help us to answer. Here we are. Send us. Lord, we pray all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus, the one who taught us to pray together, singing. Christ attend you, the love of God surround you, and the Holy Spirit keep you this day and always. Amen.
Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm going to shut this off. <laughs>